So, so this is my plan for the coming two hours. So, I'll start by giving an introduction to contact geometry, meaning I'll remind you the notion of what the contact structure, what uh, uh, contact distribution is, and I'll try to illustrate it with a few examples and give motivation. Uh, physics uh, coming from physics. Then, very, very fast, I'll mention the existence theorem. on contact structures. Then I'll move a little bit to classification in the sense of distinguishing homotopy classes, isotopy classes of contact structures. So I'm going to Gray's theorem. So this is going to be um, isotopies, contact homomorphisms. and Gray's theorem. And uh, the last topic is uh, recalling um, a few connections that we have between uh, symplectic and contact geometry. And by this I mean Constructions that, for example, allow us to go from a contact manifold to a symplectic manifold, or how to produce, up to some, using some additional data, uh, contact some manifolds living inside symplectic manifolds. So that's uh, uh, more or less the plan. So let's go. As my student there suggested, I'll start with the definition of what the contact structure is. All right. So a contact structure is some sort of uh, hyperplane distribution on a manifold. So so it's a. Uh, smooth field of hyperplanes, or in other words, a, a co-dimension one distribution, which is maximally non-integrable. And of course, I have to clarify for you what's the mean of being maximally non-integrable for a distribution, and I'll do it uh, in contrast with uh, the distributions which are the tiny spaces to co-dimension one foliations. So what is integrability for a co-dimension one distribution, and in general for a distribution of uh, any rank? So it means that it's the distribution tangent, in this case, to a co-dimension one foliation. And if you want to write this down in terms of forms, uh, what you basically do is the following. So for each point in your manifold, uh, you take alpha, a local, possibly local, one form whose kernel uh, is xi. And the maximal non-integrability means that d of alpha restricted to alpha equals zero, right? And well, maximal non-integrability is the opposite. So you have your co-dimension one distribution. You have, for each point, a local one form. And would you? Yeah. Sorry, I didn't understand. Ah. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, so basically, you require uh, these two forms to have no kernel on this 
symplectic distribution equivalently. So you can define this sharp map that goes from xi to its dual, and you want this to be a linear isomorphism. And uh, if you want to write this in a different way, so assume that uh, Well, I'll do it a little bit later. So, just a, a few remarks about the definition. Uh, first one is that uh, that definition, that notion of maximal non-integrability does not depend on alpha, which is our possibly local contact to one form. And this is basically the standard computation. If you have another one form that represents the foliation, then you're simply scaling by a non-zero number or by a function that never vanishes the original form, and you simply relate the two exterior derivatives. Right? And we restrict this to the common kernel of alpha and alpha prime. Yeah, so what happens is that this first summons dies away, and you're basically scaling the original uh, two form by a nowhere zero factor at each point. And in particular, this is telling you that uh, whenever you have a contact structure, what you have is a conformal class of linear symplectic structures on your distribution. So you have to consider a corresponding conformal class, right? Um, Second observation is that, of course, I mean, if that, it, uh, if that is a symplectic vector bundle, must have even dimension, which implies that uh, m xi is odd dimensional. And um, it's, uh, it's not even part of our remark. Just, well, I mean, you can restate that condition, again, using the usual language of linear symplectic geometry, I mean, what's the meaning of this being a uh, linear symplectic structure? It means that the top power is a volume form for this distribution. So alpha is a contact one form, perhaps local, on M, or let's say on U, if and only U of dimension 2 and plus 1, if and only alpha, which d alpha to the nth power is a volume form. Again, in analogy with the kind of computation or the kind of checks that you do when you want to make sure that a two form is a symplectic form uh, on a many form. All right, so what is then contact geometry? So if you want to follow in plane, contact geometry, is the study of, uh, let's say, its magnitudes, its properties, invariant by diffeomorphisms preserving the contact, st the contact structure. So contact geometry of xi uh, is magnitudes properties invariant by diffeomorphisms preserving your contact distribution, so by the so-called contact homomorphisms. And again, by definition, these are diffeomorphisms such that 
they preserve the contact distribution. All right, so uh, so let me give you one example of a, let's say, a magnitude the property which is invariant by contact homomorphisms, the kind of objects you study when you do contact geometry. So. So um, typical object that you study when you're doing contact geometry are isotropic submanifolds. Okay. No. Isotropic submanifolds, by definition, are submanifolds which are everywhere tangent to the contact distribution. So again, if you're not used to contact structures, but you're a little bit familiar with uh, symplectic geometry, you follow the lectures by Alessia this morning, you remember that uh, the way you introduce isotropic submanifolds in symplectic geometry is a little bit different because you want some manifolds such that the restriction of the symplectic form uh, is vanishing at every single point. But it does; it, uh, it so happens that these submanifolds satisfy that property because you see. Uh, imagine that you have uh, alpha, your local one form, defining the contact distribution. Now, because your submanifold is tangent to the distribution, it means that when you pull back the one form to the submanifold n, the one form is identically zero, which implies that the of alpha also restricted to the submanifold is identically zero, which implies that for each point, what you have here is an isotropic linear subspace of the corresponding symplectic distribution. And as we know, the notion of being isotropic is invariant by scaling. So here is well defined regardless of the local one form that I'm using. So all in all, these isotropic sum manifolds uh, turn out to be linearly, turn out to define linearly isotropic subspaces of this symplectic distribution. In particular, if you know a little bit about the limitations in dimension that you have in symplectic geometry, you know that uh, these isotropic submanifolds can have dimension. Well, let me just put here another remark. So uh, n isotropic has dimension. less or equal than half of the dimension of the symplectic distribution. And again, amongst isotropic submanifolds, as it is the case in symplectic geometry, uh, the most relevant ones are the ones that have top dimension, the analog to Lagrangian submanifolds in symplectic geometry, which is what one calls here Legendrians. So if the dimension is n, then n is a Legendrian submanifold. And of course, being Legendrian is invariant by contact homomorphism, so that's the kind of objects that you would study on a contact manifold. So try to classify Legendrians up to, for example, isotope, if you can. Uh, all right, so let me give you some examples mm, of contact structures, and I'll start in dimension three, because I want to clarify a little bit how you interpret geometrically that the contact distribution is maximally non-integrable, right? So in terms analytically, using one forms is very clear. The definition is the only one which is reasonable. But how, that, how does the definition translate uh, geometrically? So let me start with the following example. So this is maximal non-integrability. in dimension three. So in R3, uh, with coordinates x, u, p, I'll consider alpha sub capital L, which is the one form du minus p dx. 
And this happens to be a contact one form. So let me just do a very fast check. So first of all, uh, this one form is nowhere vanishing. So it means that it defines its kernel is a hyperplane distribution. It's a plane distribution. And if I want to make sure that this is a contact form, what I have to do is wedge this one form, in this case, with its uh, exterior uh, derivative, because this is a three form. And make sure that this is a volume form. Now you do the computations, and uh, you get up to sign. You. Yes. Well, the standard volume form up to sign, depending on the order of, of variables, right? So that's a contact distribution. Uh, so let's try to make a picture of how does the distribution look like. So I'll use here the u axis, the x axis, and this is the p axis. Um, so you see, I mean, um, the first observation is that, I mean, uh, all vertical lines are tangent to the contact distribution, right? So you can see that. So let me record that here. So vertical lines are tangent to the kernel of alpha L. And what I'm going to do is basically pick one of these vertical lines. It doesn't really matter uh, which one I choose, because I mean, again, um, so the one form doesn't depend on the variables u, x, so I can't translate things on this plane. And I'm going to take, for example, this p axis, and I'm going to see what happens with the distribution, with the contact distribution, as I move up along the axis, right? So I'll start here at the origin. So at the origin, uh, for p equals 0, the one form is du. Uh, so it means that. This is the plane at this point. And let's see what happens as we move up along the p-axis. So you see, as we move up along the p-axis, uh, what we have is, for example, at this point, we have a plane that also contains the p-axis. And then, well, it will have a slope here. So there will be also another line in the plane whose slope is basically p. So you see what happens here is that As you go up, your plane distribution starts rotating along this vertical line. So that's the geometric notion. How's, that's the way to interpret uh, maximal non-integrability. So your contact distribution is rotating, right? And, and it rotates with a strictly positive speed, because otherwise you will see the vanishing of this volume form if the speed is not strictly positive at some point. All right, so that's the first example. That's a somewhat a local example. We're in R3, so let me give you a similar global example to which we'll, we will go back later on. So the global example, well, is, T3, is R3 in disguise, but I'm going to basically go down to a compact manifold. So I'll, I'm going to work with the three torus. Um, I use periodic coordinates. And uh, I'll define the following one forms. This is a family of one forms which is parametrized by integers different from 0. And this is cosine of n theta 3 d theta 1 plus sine of n theta 3 the theta 2. And again, you can check easily that this is a contact one form. So basically, take again this quantity. And you end up with a multiple of the standard volume form or the quotient of the volume form in R3, this quotient to T3. And so let's choose. Uh, 
axis. So again, never mind the quotient. So let's work in R3 with our periodic coordinates. So if we choose this axis, we basically see something which is very similar to what we see here. So you see uh, so vertical lines, we call vertical, between quotation marks, vertical lines are tangent to xi n, which is the curve of alpha n. And again, if we basically move along one of these vertical lines, what happens with the distribution? Well, you see that it's again rotating. So at this time, as you are inside these three torus, when you basically close up, depending on the integer, so you basically turn n times in one direction or in the opposite direction. But essentially, at least locally, is the same situation as we had here. I mean, there is some rotation along line curves which are contained inside the contact distribution. By the way, these lines, going back to that definition, they are isotropic because we are in dimension three. They are as big as they can be in terms of the dimension. So these are Legendrian curves that are inside the contact distribution. And what I'm saying here is pretty much something uh, which is general to any contact structure on a three manifold. You can always find local coordinates such that the situation is like this. So let me sketch that very, very fast. So in general, for a three manifold with a contact structure, around any point uh, there exist coordinates such that xi is the kernel of that one form alpha sub capital L. So how do you get those coordinates? So first of all, here, I mean, we have the U explain. This U explain has, in the, I mean, the relevant geometric property with respect to the contact distribution is that this plane is transverse to the contact distribution. So in general, what you do is you pick any surface, any germ of surface, which is transverse to your contact distribution. Well, because it is transverse to the contact distribution, it means that in this surface, the contact, the intersection, at each point of the surface, the intersection is going to give you a line. So you're going to get a line field on the contact distribution. That line field can be integrated. So you have this line field. You integrate it, and you basically put local coordinates um, so that the lines are exactly the lines that you, uh, that you have there. So the lines are given by, uh, I think it's u equals to constant. Right? Now you generalize a little bit the construction of these vertical legendrians. So how you do that? Uh, so again, you can take a one-parameter family of planes which are simultaneously transversal to the surface and to the contact distribution. That's going to produce on each of the planes, again, a family of legendrians uh, that you're going to use as vertical coordinates once you parameterize them in the right way. So choose uh, a one parameter family of surfaces which are both transverse to xi x and the contact distribution, and which also fill a neighborhood of the point x. If you do that, you get morally the translates of the PU plane over there. Uh, well, you have here your one-parameter family of 
curves tangent to the distribution, your like Gendrians, uh, and you simply uh, consider any vector field whose integral curves are precisely given by these uh, curves. So pick, pick, uh, so pick an isotopy, a local isotopy, local isotopy. So let me call this P will be the coordinate is isotopy with integral curves. The Legendrians. And well, you're almost done in the sense that if you pick one of these Legendrians and you see what happens with uh, the corresponding, the pullback of your contact form to these coordinates, you'll see that the contact distribution is actually doing the right thing, it's rotating. But it so happens that it rotates at different speed on each Legendrian. So the only thing that you need to do is to normalize, to multiply times a function so that you normalize in the appropriate way. Actually, you have to normalize the derivative of some of the coordinates that appear. So just and normalization. So what you see here is like a normal form theorem, really, uh, so done in a very pedestrian way. Of course, we'll see that we do have local norm theorems, dark blue theorems, done in a different way that work for any dimension. But I think at least it's uh, interesting to see how things work uh, in three dimensions, because, uh, well, it's quite intuitive. Um, OK, so more examples. So these are examples in low dimension. So I really wanted to, at the very beginning, illustrate what's the meaning of maximal non-integrability to give a hint that of the existence of local normal forms for contact structures. Uh, and now I want to go to uh, examples in bigger dimensions. So um, firstly, uh, Again, I'm going to look at local examples. And for that, I'm going to consider in R2 n plus 1 with coordinates, uh, well, x1, x2, n plus 1, the following affine one forms. Um, I'm going to call it uh, alpha sub capital L, which is going to basically generalize the previous formula that we have hit there. <coughs> ah, so this be minus one. And then um, the alpha standard, which is slightly different. Do I want to do this? I think it's one half of the well exercise. These are contact one forms, and either of them will serve as a local model in arbitrary dimensions. Uh, so let me give you now a nonlinear example. So this nonlinear example, again drawing an analogy with, um, with symplectic geometry, is what's going to replace uh, the cotangent bundle of any given manifold. So for any manifold, the cotangent bundle is a canonical. Yes, please. Yes. Yeah. So I get these Legendrians. Okay. Then I'll take another surface. It's actually a one parameter family of surfaces, Those are any other surfaces, which are both transverse to the original surface okay. and to the contact distribution. Okay. So that's the only condition. Uh, this condition of transversality to the contact distribution will tell me that they, they are basically filled by Legendrian lines. And the transversality condition to the surface basically means that the Legendrian line does not lie in the surface. So it's vertical, so to speak. And then I follow these Legendrian lines and the vertical, the vertical ones. Yes, sorry, I should uh, pick with integral lines the 
can I put here vertical legendrians? Yeah, so I can choose one and then basically I can displace it a little bit because these are transversality conditions that they are open conditions. So if they hold at a point at this surface of, over this point X, I can get a one parameter family of surfaces with that property that fill the three manifold, right? And uh, by doing so, what I get basically is uh, a third coordinate. So you see, using this flow, I extend the coordinates UX in this surface to global coordinates. And then I use the time as third coordinate. I think I lost you when you moved between the <laughs> Okay, so again, I choose, uh, let me say, I choose one surface which is simultaneously transverse to psi of x and to the contact distribution. So it will be this one. This is an open condition. This is a transversality condition, so which means that I can displace this surface to basically fill a neighborhood of X with. Yes. Which one is X? <laughs> okay. uh, sure. The fixed point. Sorry. This is X, and this is the surface. Okay. Then I fill a neighborhood using these surfaces. They are all transverse to the contact distribution, so they are filled by Legendrian lines. So basically, I fill this neighborhood of X with vertical Legendrian lines. These vertical Legendrian lines, and we can, this is a one parameter family of curves, so they are the associated, so if you want, you can choose a vector field which is tangent. Produce the corresponding isotopy. Use the time coordinate of the isotopy as coordinate P. And use this P coordinate also to extend the coordinates UX, that remember, these are local coordinates on the surface, but then you extend it. Then you get three coordinates, you write down the corresponding formula for the pullback of the contact form, and you see that geometrically, as you move through these vertical legendrians, you really go rotating. It's just that, depending on the legendrian you choose, you rotate at different speed. So you have to normalize so that all the speeds are the same. And that normalization is basically dividing by a chosen, an appropriately chosen function. Right. Uh, so dividing this coordinate. So rescaling the time along this curve to move in the, at the appropriate speed. Um, so, okay, so I was uh, giving more examples, and the next one that I want to uh, show to you is a nonlinear one, so it's the replacement for the cotangent bundle of a manifold in the contact world. So, M is a manifold, and we're going to consider the manifold of so called contact elements. So, this is simply the collection of hyperplanes inside of the tangent space of the manifold for every point in the manifold, right? So remember that there's an obvious, there's an tautological projection over the manifold. And <coughs> this is a fiber bundle, so the fiber basically at a given point is the collection of hyperplanes in the tiny space, so it's a projection, it's a projective space. So this is the projectivization of T star of M X minus the origin, right? Uh, and let me also make the following very simple observation, is that what is a section to this bundle? So it's basically a choice at a given point of the manifold of a hyperplane on the tangent bundle. So sections here are, are hyperplane distributions. So that's a different way of presenting hyperplane distribution, and it's convenient to put a topology in them. So sections of this bundle are the same thing as hyperplane distributions. Well, um, it turns out that this manifold has a canonical contact distribution. So at a given point here, meaning for a fixed hyperplane of the tangent space at a point x, I'm going to define a hyperplane of this manifold in a very natural way. So I do the following thing. I use this projection from the manifold of contact elements to M. Uh, notice that at this point on the contact elements, really down here represents a hyperplane, so I can, I can pull it back using the differential of pi, right? So I can take pi star minus 1 at h of x 
of the hyperplane itself. Because this is a submersion, when you pull back a hyperplane, you get a hyperplane on the manifold upstairs. So this is a field of hyperplanes on the manifold of contact elements, right? It's a canonical one. So now I have to convince you that this hyperplane distribution is actually contact. So how do we do that? Uh, well, we, we'll take coordinates around a given point here, and we'll uh, present in one form whose kernel is this distribution, and we'll show the contact condition. So how does it go? Uh, you do as follows. So locally, you take on your base manifold coordinates, x1, xn. So these are local coordinates. on M, so for example, define on a neighborhood U. And of course, you're gonna work on pi minus one of this neighborhood. And what are the coordinates that you're going to use here? Well, um, actually not in the whole pi minus one. So I'm gonna take the following thing. Um, so for any index, say I choose J, one of the indices. I'm going to look at the hyperplanes in the manifold of contact elements such that uh, x belongs to you. And also, the hyperplane is transverse to the local vector field associated to the jth coordinate, right? So this is a transversality condition, which means that in this open subset is going to, in this uh, open subset of the manifold local elements, is going to select an open subset, those hyperplanes which live on points on U and which are transverse uh, to some coordinate. So what's the use of that transverse coordinate? Well, it's the following one. So you split. So it, Let's see, in the picture, you use this transverse coordinate as vertical coordinates. So here you have x1 up to xn minus xj. And how you represent here a hyperplane in this subset. So we can call this subset u sub j. So an element in u sub j corresponds to a hyperplane on a point in the open u where your coordinates are defined, with the additional condition that this hyperplane is transverse to the vertical coordinate, right? So this would be one such h. Being transverse means that you can express it as the graph of a function here. In other words, that you can write down slopes for each of the remaining directions, different from j. So what you do is you use, at the very end of the day, your coordinates x1, xn, and then you use p1, pn, the slopes. Right. If you write these coordinates, then it turns out that the contact distribution, alpha, is given by the following formula. Right. So these coordinates are the slopes. And this formula, actually, is the formula that I gave you before. So in these natural coordinates, our, uh, this one form whose kernel is our distribution is one of the model contact one forms. So that's one simple way of, of checking that this is a contact uh, distribution. Um, so OK, so this is, would be uh, the first property, xi is contact. There's a second obvious property, which is analogous to the one that you have for cotangent bundles. I mean, for a cotangent bundle, whenever you have a diffeomorphism on the base manifold, it leads to a simple ectomorphism on the cotangent bundle. Here is, it is the same. So if you take phi, a diffeomorphism of M, so you can lift it to a diffeomorphism of the manifold of contact elements. And not surprisingly, this is a contact homomorphism. It preserves the contact distribution, right? OK. Um, one more example. Um, 
So I basically, basically uh, show an example that when you work out locally, what you see is uh, one of the, let's say, canonical, one of the nice linear, I find one forms, contact one forms in R2n plus one. Uh, I want to show you, let's say, a different generalization of the cotangent bundle in the world of contact manifolds. So again, for a manifold, we have the manifold of contact elements, which is canonically a contact manifold. We have a second construction that out of a manifold produces a contact manifold. So given a manifold, you can look at the one jets of functions on the manifold. So the manifold of one jets is basically You basically look at the equivalence classes of functions, where at each point you basically look at the expansion up to order one of the function. Now, uh, topologically, there's a natural identification of the manifold of one jets with the cotangent bundle plus a trivialized uh, line bundle. So essentially, what you do is, given this class here, you assign d of f of x and f of x. Uh, so let me call this coordinate here, the coordinate uh, u. And of course, in the cotangent bundle, we have the Liouville one form. So what I can do here is write the following one form. I can write, let's say, the pullback of the Liouville one form to this direct sum, to this product manifold. Uh, and then use this coordinate to cook this one form. So alpha u minus the pullback of the Liouville one form. And uh, well, um, so this is again alpha capital L in local coordinates, right? So this is a contact form. So this is another example of a contact manifold which is canonically attached to any manifold. So let me take advantage of that example to go back and tell you what's the geometric motivation. So where is the origin of contact geometry? So uh, how contact structures uh, appeared for the first time? Of course, not with that name. So contact structures appeared for the first time in, uh, in the work of Lee. So this is the this is the origin of contact the structures, and uh, this is the geometrization of ODEs, and this is, was done by Lee in uh, 1872. And, okay, so what are the solutions of an ODE in one variable? Solutions of an ODE, U of X, so this ODE is given by a relation between the coordinates X, the function U of X, and it's derivative. And you want to somewhat give a, perhaps, a geometric recipe under some genericity conditions to get solutions of this ODE, right? Which is not basically trying to use analytical methods. And uh, the geometric way to go around this is the following one. So this function that defines the relation between the variable x, the function, and its derivative, really, you can think that this is a function on R3, where you use variables x, u, and p, right? So um, this means that the solutions of your ODE, uh, they are some curves in R3, which are contained in this hypersurface, and which, which also uh, so have a very specific formula. Mm -hmm. 
where p of x has to be u dot of x, right? So that's, those are the curves we are interested in. And um, well, what you can do is express this last condition of part of it in the following way. So essentially, you take the Lie one, the one form which you can attribute to Lie. So this one form is du minus uh, pdx. And what you see simply is that this relation implies that the corresponding curve in R3 is tangent to that distribution. So that relation implies that, uh, well, the curves are living inside this upper surface and the curve is tangent to this distribution. And this uh, allows you to recognize geometrically the solutions of the ODE, like I said, under some generality conditions. So first of all, assume that zero is a regular value for this function. So what you have here really is a surface. So you are in x, u, p, and we, sh we shall assume that this is f minus 1 of 0. Uh, second genericity assumption. Assume that the surface is transverse to the contact distribution defined by the uh, Lie 1 form. So again, that implies that the intersection is going to be a line distribution inside of the surface. So these are the potential candidates to be solutions of your ODE. So there's a third generosity condition that uh, it's required here, which is that they, they should have a right, I mean, an appropriate projection in this plane. So you can express the u variable as a function on the x variable. So it's a third generosity condition. So again, you can recover solutions of ODEs uh, by means of geometry. Uh, upon imposing some uh, genericity conditions. So that's, uh, uh, I guess, the first place in the literature where you see contact geometry appearing, or contact forms. Um, all right. And what did it do? Was it like, what did they do specifically? I have no idea. I never read the paper. <laughs> I have to be honest about that. I never read the paper. So again, what you read when, uh, so the comments that you read about the paper is that you can use this kind of result to basically get, again, uniqueness results. But this uniqueness result is basically the implicit function theorem. So um, uh, I don't know whether Maria Amelia is over here. So there's some people here working on this kind of uh, uh, structures, contact structures on jet bundles. And I think this is the right people to answer that question. I'm not. Um, So perhaps I, I can finish uh, by making another remark and also illustrating it with an example. Um, so another remark. Um, so this is about orientability. So a hyperplane distribution is the kernel of a one form, a global one form, remember, if and only if D is co-orientable. Um, and um, so for instance, and that's an interesting exercise for those of you uh, who are interested, you can check that the manifold of contact elements with the standard contact form uh, so this distribution, this contact distribution, is not co-orientable. Well, that's one example of a hyperplane distribution which is not co-orientable. Anyhow, we know that when we have non-co-orientable distributions, we can get rid of non-co-orientability by passing to an appropriate double cover. So again, you can take um, so uh, you can take loops. Uh, preserving orientation, and this is an index to I never remember what the order in which you write these things so 
this has index two, so this gives you a cover, a covering map. And of course, whenever you have your original distribution, which was not orientable, you pull it back on this covering map, and you get a orientable distribution that you can define as a kernel of one form. I mean, this is simply uh, a remark that it's useful because, I mean, whenever you're doing contact geometry, there is no loss of generality in working with global contact forms. Because if that's not the case, you go to the double cover and you do equivariant constructions in contact geometry over here. Now, equivariant constructions, when you have a finite group, are things that are basically quite manageable. So, essentially, you can somewhat forget about uh, non orientable contact structures. Ah, so I'll finish. I think this is time to finish. So I told you, I don't think I convinced you at all, I didn't try that, the manifold of contact elements with the standard contact distribution is an example of a distribution which is not orientable. Hence, you can apply that trick. So what happens when we go to the double cover? Which manifold do we get? And which contact structure do we get? So for instance, So I'll do it in the wrong order because I need more space. So uh, this double cover, um, so, so what are the points here? These are on, at each point on the tangent bundle a hyperplane. So a hyperplane is the, the zero of a nowhere of a uh, <coughs> of a non-zero uh, linear one form, which you can define up to scaling, right? Now that, kind of, that the scaling is a real number which can be either positive or negative. So what you do when you go to this two to one cover is you consider only scalings by, by positive numbers. So, which means that instead of considering hyperplanes or their perpendicular lines, you consider oriented hyperplanes or oriented lines. Now, oriented lines are essentially uh, the sphere bundle. I don't want to call it a sphere for the moment. It's the projectivization of the, uh, is the positive projectivization uh, of the tangent bundle, right? So, by this general construction, there is a contact structure here that you can define by a contact one form. So, what might be uh, one way of recovering that contact structure? So, you see, um, this manifold, uh, as I told you, uh, it can be realized in very different ways. Uh, typically, what you do is that you, take, you pick a Riemannian metric on the tangent bundle of the manifold, and you take the corresponding sphere bundle for that Riemannian metric. So this manifold is, upon the choice of metric, canonically isomorphic to the sphere bundle of your tangent union bundle. Uh, sorry, of the cotangent bundle. On the cotangent bundle, we have the Liouville one form which we can restrict, for example, to this spherical cotangent bundle. And it turns out that this contact one form is a contact one form whose associated contact distribution is this one. So that's a different way of presenting this uh, two to one cover. All right, so I think I'll, I'm gonna stop here and uh, I think in, in half, half hour, I'll continue telling a little bit about this monster theorem, recent theorem, uh, on the existence of contact structures, mostly on compact manifolds, on closed manifolds.